In this collection of videos, we are going to talk about social choice theory, also known as voting theory. Now I have a slide here where I'm going to let you read a quote that came from a book that I read a long time ago called The Poisonwood Bible. And part of the reason that I'm doing this is I want to explain at the very start of the videos that my particular history and perspective comes from the United States and the voting system that we have here. However, I think it's really important for us all to understand, no matter what culture we originally come from, that across the world there are very different perspectives about things that are considered fair and not fair. And that'll be the source of a lot of discussion as we're working through the voting theory unit. So I remember the first time in high school sort of reading this quote about a particular society, the Congolese in this example, who thought that this concept of a majority rules voting system was just absolutely crazy. And so here you have a quote from this character describing how can it be that one person gets 50 votes and the other gets 49 and somebody with 49 votes just plum loses. You know, this particular character found that idea to just be crazy and said that's certainly going to lead to unhappiness. And so in the book, the Congolese are said to not have this type of voting system, but rather the tribe would get together and they would discuss issues until they could sway something more like the entire tribe or at least something like a three quarters majority to a particular way of thinking. Um, and in fact, popes are actually elected in this manner. You need a two-thirds majority in agreement when people are voting on who the pope is, and they just continue to vote and pray and meditate until they um, are all persuaded to an individual candidate. So there are lots of examples in the world of systems that don't operate like the United States with this majority rules, and that's one of the things that we're going to explore. So I want to start out with some of the most basic terminology that we'll be studying here. We are going to be talking a lot about voting systems, or in other words, social choice functions. So functions are a mathematical thing where we talk about an input and an output. And in a social choice function, the input is going to be the individual preferences of a group of people. And the output is going to be a single decision that's made on behalf of the group with all of those individual inputs as well, inputs into determining that choice. So that's what a social choice function is. It's some sort of mechanism for making a group or collective decision based on the input of the individuals. Now this definition is very simple and the outcome that we want from this process is equally simple. But much like a function, when you think about this black box as there's some input that we know is going into the function, and some desired output, all of the devil is in the details into how that decision is made. And none of that is dictated by the definition of a social choice function. And there are in fact lots of different ways that we could change the process that's going on in that black box to come up with different possible outputs, which is the source of a lot of what we'll be studying here. Another thing that you'll see a lot in social choice functions or in voting theory is that we don't often describe a lot about what we want to be happening inside that black box. It's much easier to take a complementary approach and in fact to describe the things that we do not want. So almost all of the criteria and conditions that we're going to place on our social choice functions are going to be rules along the lines of it should not do this, it should not do that. So we won't be telling the social choice function what to do, we'll be telling it what not to do. There's a little bit of a break from that here. The first word we're going to talk about is that of anonymity or a voting system that's said to be anonymous. What anonymous means in terms of voting theory is that each voter is treated equally. It's this notion of one person, one vote. You can see an example here of something that would not be anonymous. And that's if somehow one person were allowed more than one vote, in this example three votes, while all the other people in the system were only allowed one vote. So anonymity has to do with the treatment of each voter, and when we have a system that's truly anonymous, each voter is treated equally. If a system lacks anonymity or is not anonymous, then that means that some voters in the system have more power than others. On the other hand is the idea of neutrality. Neutrality 
is when we have candidates in the election who are treated equally. So a neutral voting system is one where that is true. Each candidate has equal possibility of winning the election. And a voting system is not neutral if there are individual candidates who somehow have more power than the others. So the way that I've shown this over here on the right is I've shown a vote for this bottom candidate with three check marks. If each individual vote for the second candidate gets three, while a vote for the first candidate is only worth one, then the second candidate by nature has a higher probability of winning as each vote for them counts for more than it does for the first candidate. Now in this particular picture, it's difficult to see from the perspective of these two hands if votes are for candidate one or candidate two. So I've only drawn one candidate two getting three check marks. If any of these votes were in fact for candidate two, you should envision three check marks on those ballots as well. In the anonymous case, this particular voter got to cast three ballots. It is sort of the same to have three check marks for one person on this ballot, but it wouldn't be specific to this person. It would be specific to any person who happened to be voting for that candidate. So it's a subtle difference, but is the difference between anonymous voting systems and neutral voting systems. To give more examples of these two criteria, I'd like to talk about the fact that frequently we do have voting systems that are not anonymous. If you live in the United States, then one thing you're familiar with with how the United States elects presidential candidates is that we don't actually have a direct democracy where each person gets one vote. What our voters do is vote for electors who ultimately cast the votes that matter. And because of the electoral college and the way that that was created, one consequence of the electoral college is that not every single person in the United States carries as much weight when it comes to their vote because each state has a different number of electors. Therefore, each state has a different number of votes that it ultimately casts towards a particular candidate. So what I have over here on the right is a map that has color coded the United States according to how powerful they are based on the Electoral College. So states that are this dark greenish color, the darker they are, the more power each individual who lives in that state has according to the population of that state and how many electors that state represents in the Electoral College. And then the states that are very white and light in this picture are those that have relatively few electors for the population of that state. So from this picture, you can see that states like Ohio, Pennsylvania, perhaps Texas and Montana, and maybe New Hampshire over here, all carry quite a lot of weight in the Electoral College, where states like New York, Illinois, and California carry relatively little power per individual. So the Electoral College is an example of a voting system that is not anonymous. This picture also sheds a little bit of light if you are familiar with presidential campaigns as to why states like Ohio and Iowa get so much attention in terms of the amount of campaigning that happens there. They have relatively high power in terms of the Electoral College, and both of these particular states have histories of voting for either candidate, and so really those electoral votes are truly up for grabs and they carry a lot of power, which is why these two states get a whole lot of attention during presidential elections. Now it's also important to note that we don't have to be considering a system of actual voting in order to be talking about social choice theory. And one of the systems that I think shows a system that is not neutral very well is actually the concept of grading scales. And again, I'm coming at this from a historically American perspective, we have this 90, 80, 70, 60 grading scale in the United States of what determines grades of A, B, C, D, and F. We could think about those grades as candidates in an election. And each time we complete an assignment, we're casting a vote for what our grade should be. However, any grade in the range of zero to 59 counts as an F, while an A grade can only fall in the range of 90 to 100. This gives votes for the candidate F in the failing range significantly more power 
then votes for candidates in the passing range, you can see how unbalanced this seesaw is. And in fact, if you have a single vote of zero on an assignment, the most powerful F that one could be giving, you would need two perfect scores just to balance out that grading scale. And so this is a very non-neutral system if we think about the grades as the candidates, when a single vote is cast for this candidate, it's twice as powerful as a vote for this candidate. This is one reason on my exams in particular, I say never leave anything blank because I don't want you to vote for that zero. And in fact, I'll go so far as to say, if you just draw me a picture of a cat, I'll give you partial credit. Half the reason I believe in that system is because putting anything down on the sheet of paper can get me away from that zero grade and can make this scale a little bit more balanced.